Charles here. Let's do 2021. Oops, that's too thick. Let's do 2021 uh, set one. This is set one. Uh, number three. The diagram above shows the market for corn in micro land. Corn is produced and sold in a constant cost, perfectly competitive market. They want us to calculate the total revenue earned by corn farmers at the equilibrium price. So we know our equilibrium price is right where supply and demand come together. So it looks like the price of the market is $5. We know that at $5, the quantity sold and purchased would be 50. So this is the quantity that the market would now buy. They are asking about total revenue. We should know that total revenue is simply price times quantity. At a price of $5 and a quantity of 50, we can see our total revenue is 250. Hopefully we can see that. Dollars is obviously the value there. Uh, all right, let's go to B. In the attempt to assist corn farmers, you have right micro land, the government sets a $7 price floor on corn. Let's make sure we talk about price floors and price ceilings again. Price floors, we have a little mantra we say, floors are high and ceilings are low. Meaning that a price floor must be above the equilibrium price and a price ceiling has to be below the equilibrium price. To be effective, price floors have to be higher than the equilibrium and price ceilings would have to be lower than the equilibrium. What we can see about this is that at a $7 price floor, it is definitely higher than the equilibrium price of $5. So this is what we call an effective price floor. It will actually change what happens in the market. So uh, at $7, how many bushels of corn will be exchanged, purchased, bought, sold? At seven bucks, we come across, tick, 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 boom, we hit demand, we go straight down. And 30 bushels will be sold uh, at $7. Now, understand here that what's going on is that, and they say exchanged, obviously at seven bucks, suppliers are going to supply more of this good. But when they say exchanged, they're talking about buying and selling. So to be able to have something bought and sold, there has to be this agreement between buyers and sellers. At $7, 30 of these would be sold. They want us to calculate the deadweight loss. Now, associated with the price floor, I'll show your work. Uh, deadweight loss. We need a good definition of deadweight loss. Loss of consumer surplus. and producer surplus. Um, that's a good definition. I like that definition. You could also say it's a loss of total welfare. Society's worse off due to the price floor. I like to also think of it, and I think it's important, it is a loss of quantity that society gets. Remember, with the low $5 price or the equilibrium $5 price, Society got 50, bought 50 of these bushels of corn. But with now with the higher price floor, obviously the quantity demanded for corn for bushels falls. Society would lose this amount of consumer surplus and this amount of producer surplus in that triangle. This area here is dead weight loss, right? Those two air that consumer and producer surplus that is lost is your dead weight loss, right? It is a loss of quantity. Society is worse off. They've had a loss of total welfare, a loss of total benefit. There is a loss of quantity. I hope that explains it. And we just have to know how to find that triangle, that area of dead weight loss right there. So it looks like our height goes from three to seven. That's four. That's our height. Oops, let's say height. Uh, times the base, our base is just, you can just go straight across there. That looks like 20, right? So it is 4 times 20, which is 80, and this would be divided by 2, so divided by 2. 
height times base divided by 2, or you could say most of us, 1 half base times height, however you want to do it, obviously just make it happen. Uh, 40 would be our answer here. Assume the government agrees to buy the unsold quantity at $7. Calculate producer surplus. Now, let's talk about producer surplus. This is a bit strange in that we don't tend to think. We don't. Let's talk about it for just a second because I think it's important to remember. If I just draw a regular supply and demand curve, and that's my price, that's PM, that's my equilibrium price, that's my equilibrium quantity, QM, what I know is that area of the triangle, that triangle right there is consumer surplus and that's producer surplus. Now, the way we say it, I like to say it, is that everything above the price and below demand equals consumer surplus. Everything below the price but above supply equals producer surplus. So here's our price at $7. Boom, we go across till we hit the supply curve. Everything below the price, but above supply. Can we see that? Everything above supply, but below the price. This is all producer surplus here. So again, it's just back to the area of a triangle. So it looks like seven is the height. The base is 70, right, which I think is 490, if I'm doing that correctly, 245 divided by 2. I think this is right. That's to calculating the producer surplus, 245, right, dollars, obviously. They do want you to show your work, so you'd have to point to it and make sure they could see it. Uh, all right, assume that the price floor in the government buying program remains in effect. Uh, in addition, assume the demand for corn does not change. In the long run, will the quantity of corn purchased by the government increase, decrease, or remain the same? Explain. So what we understand is that the consumers, let's get rid of a little bit of this here, so we can see, well, I didn't really want to get rid of that, but I'll go back and draw it in. At a $7 price, I know that this amount is being supplied. By, by producers. I know this amount is being consumed because that's where we're hitting our demand curve at seven. So this amount, that quantity right there is being bought by consumers. This quantity is being bought by the government. Now, the price is higher than the equilibrium price, right? And more suppliers are supplying that additional amount and the government is buying it. So some of these suppliers, some of these producers, let's say, are making profits above and beyond what the market would have given them, right? The profits, because the government is now paying them a higher price than the equilibrium price, and it's actually buying their stuff. So that means additional profits for firms. If there's profits, the way we always talk about it, in the short run, if there's positive economic profits, in the long run, we know firms are going to enter. As more firms enter, they're going to produce more stuff. As they produce more stuff, right, will the quantity of corn purchased by the government increase? It will increase as more firms are attracted to these profits. More firms are going to enter this industry and they're going to produce more bushels of corn. The College Board also talks about that in the long run, what we know with supply is supply becomes more elastic. So there's going to be a larger, as our supply curve becomes more elastic here, there's going to be a larger amount of production of this good. I would stick with the understanding. That I don't mind, uh, but it doesn't ring as true to me. I mean, obviously, it makes sense that supply becomes more elastic in the long run. But I like this idea, I like this explanation here of that as the government is paying an above equilibrium price for corn, suppliers are going to supply more of it because they're going to be making profits. Uh, profits attract more firms to enter, more firms are going to increase the amount of bushels that are supplied and purchased by the government. All right, my friends, that's good, I think. Be safe and 
let me know what's going on.